Okay, welcome to the afternoon session of our second day of hearings here in Miami uh, of the Ad Hoc Committee to uh, evaluate the Criminal Justice Act. Judge Cardone, our chairman here with us. Uh, and uh, we have a, a panel entirely of panel lawyers and one formal panel, former panel lawyer, I believe, today. And we have lots of questions for you all. Um, I, our, our panel members, in terms of the questioners, are going to be Neil McBride, who's a former U.S. attorney from the Eastern District of Virginia, and now a partner and a criminal defense lawyer at Davis Polk, among other things. Uh, Chip Friendsley, uh, the national CJA rep, Catherine Rowe, the federal public defender in Minnesota, and Judge Reggie Walton, from the District of the District of Columbia. And I'm Reuben Kahn, I'm the Federal Defender, the Executive Director of the CDO in San Diego. So welcome, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, we have, uh, we're very interested in the information you have to share. We'd like to get very brief opening statements from each of you. Uh, I'd like you to limit them to five minutes and just like the Court of Appeals, we're gonna have a timer up here. And uh, what we'll do is we'll start at the outside and work in. So Mr. Ayers, uh, do you wanna begin and give us an opening statement? I'll be glad to. Uh, I'm Jim Ayers, I'm from the Eastern District of North Carolina, uh, CJA panel attorney, of course. I think I've been on the panel 22, 23 years. Uh, all good experiences. I think you've heard from Mr. McNamara, who runs my district, um, runs it very efficiently. Uh, there's been a little growth in the panel that I think I mentioned in my letter that has uh, caused a reduction, I believe, in the number of cases that panel members uh, receive. Of course, that can be caused by the number of cases that are being prosecuted as well. There are a number of variables, but I generally like to handle seven, eight, nine, ten cases a year ballparking in order to I think that creates some efficiency in my knowledge of what I'm dealing with. Um, I'm always willing to ask for more money. Um, Ms. Costner inquired as to uh, if I was willing to come here. She is a panel rep, is my understanding, for the middle district or has moved up through the national level into other areas. But um, you know, generally, fees have lagged behind market rates for lawyers since I've I got into this, they always have, and I would of course expect that they always will, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm here to ask for more if, if that's proper and, and or to answer any questions. <coughs> uh, fee voucher cutting uh, transpires uh, or occurs in my district not very often. Um, I've had judges call me and tell me they're going to reduce my fees, which has always been fine. Uh, I've had other judges send me letters and explain their positions, which has been fine. And I think I've raised an issue in all my time over a fee, maybe once with the defender, Mr. McNamara. And other than that, I think it's, it's worked well. But uh, I generally bill at $300 an hour. I litigate civil cases uh, in addition to federal criminals, so I don't practice just federal criminal law like a lot of my contemporaries do. Uh, and, Generally, my overhead runs probably half of my hourly rate, usually, and uh, as a result of that, generally the, the federal criminal rate has been below what I would consider a sufficient amount to cover a firm's overhead. My, my firm is a small firm, uh, only two lawyers, a couple of staff, and we try to keep it small. And other than that, I've tried to address the other bullet points in my letter. I'd be happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Oh, I was uh, just reminded that if I can ask all of you to try and speak directly into the microphones, we are streaming this and without, even if we can hear you fine, the, uh, the broadcast may not pick it up. So as I said, we're going to work from the outside in. Uh, Ms. Copeland, and I'm interested to hear from you, you're one of the last of the orphan districts. So 
Hi, I am Mr. Kahn. I am one of the last of the orphan districts. My name is Amy Lee Copeland. I'm from the Southern District of Georgia. I live and work in Savannah, Georgia. We are one of the two or three districts in the United States, in the 93 judicial districts, that do not have a federal defender. Uh, it has changed from a manner of involuntary servitude to a volunteer army, but there are still problems with that system that I'll be happy to talk about in the question and answer session of this, of this uh, hearing. Uh, my concerns really focus on the quality and adequacy of representation in the current system in our orphan district. And some of those were set out in my letter. Just by way of background, too, I am also on the CGA panels of the Fourth and Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals and do some work by appointment on the Eleventh Circuit, which work very differently than the CGA appointments in my own district. With that, I'll give the rest of my time back and just wait for the questions. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, why don't we go to Ms. Reback? Thank you. My name is Rochelle Reback. I recently retired. Uh, prior to that, I was a criminal defense attorney for my entire career, which was about 30 years. And I was on the panel in the Middle District of Florida in Tampa for about 20 some odd years of that uh, time. And um, I was uh, here in the audience listening to the prior panel um, and I was struck by uh, the remarks from the attorney from upstate South Carolina um, where apparently ice cream doesn't make you fat and you ride to court on a unicorn. <laughs> um, you can basically assume that everything that works right in her district works wrong in my district. Um, and um, the two points that I really want to talk about is, um, I'd like to echo what Professor Baskus said too, <coughs> that um, I think primarily the problems in my district revolve around um, and it, the issue of values and the sense that my judges in my district seem to believe, mo not all of them, but many of them seem to believe that service on the CJA panel should be uh, pro bono. And you should just be happy for whatever you get. And um, that indigent defendants don't necessarily deserve a full throttle defense in, the, in terms of resources, um, experts, forensic accountants, et cetera. There are judges who come from a background where they are completely unfamiliar with criminal defense. I've practiced nothing but criminal defense for rich people my entire career. Um, I was fortunate that my practice was robust enough, my private practice, that um, I was able to be very selective in the cases that I accepted from the court. And they were primarily large, multi-defendant, white-collar cases. Um, there were judges who had those cases who were appreciative that I would take them and some other attorneys uh, would take them because we knew what to do with them and they would give us the resources that we needed to do them. But there are other judges who felt or seemed to feel that a full throttle defense was sort of obstructionist and um, annoying and held up their docket. And as long as that kind of attitude um, prevails, then everything in the system fails. And I just, I want to point out that we cannot overestimate the influence of individual judges, uh, predilections, personalities, temperaments, prejudices, and egos in this system. And um, with that, I'll yield and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Mr. Jones? Uh, thank you. My name is Mark Jones. I'm a panel member in the Middle District of North Carolina, in the Western District of North Carolina, and on the Fourth Circuit. Uh, before becoming a defense attorney, I was an assistant United States attorney in the Western District of North Carolina in Charlotte and Asheville. And I had the opportunity to clerk for two different uh, Middle District District Court judges. As I see it, we really have a three-tiered system. We have the Department of Justice and the United States Attorney's offices at the top. We then have the federal defenders or community defenders offices, and then we have the panel attorneys at the bottom. Every federal case from the government's perspective is going to come with an investigator, the case agent, sometimes two, 
who often is an attorney or an accountant, uh, and the resources that they have are seemingly unlimited. Um, the federal defender's offices have built-in research and writing attorneys, many of them. They have a pool of investigators that they can go to at the onset of a case for assistance, uh, and they have those structural advantages. The panel attorneys, at least in the districts where I practice, are predominantly solo or small firm practitioners who have their time and usually a secretary, uh, and for anything else have to go hat in hand to the district court. We heard some testimony yesterday from Lewis Allen, who's the federal defender in the Middle District of North Carolina, and I think Professor Gould had some statistics about the number of CJA panel attorneys in the Middle District of North Carolina who sought out investigators or paralegals or psychiatrists or mitigation specialists. And I think the number was that 1% of CJA-based cases are using uh, those types of services. And it means that we're coming from a district that has a cultural problem where we are not taking advantages of the resources that are out there. Um, and I wanted to speak briefly about why I think that that exists. There was a time when these requests were summarily denied by district court judges. Uh, and it has gotten so that people just don't ask anymore. And they haven't been asking for a while. And I think if you were to ask the judges now, they would say, no one is asking us. Please ask us. But uh, the panel has been conditioned uh, not to ask. And even though the composition of our bench has changed somewhat over the last five to seven years, I still think that cultural uh, legacy is there that you don't go asking for uh, paralegals. You don't go asking for experts. You don't go asking for investigators. And I, there are two reasons for that, I think. The first is that you First, you've been told no so often that there is a chilling effect. But also, I think there are panel members who believe that asking and being denied is going to have adverse consequences. And that it's first going to have adverse consequences in their case, perhaps for their client. But it's also going to have adverse consequences for them. I think they equate a denial when they ask for an investigator or for an expert as the court saying your request is frivolous. And then they get, in their mind, they think they're going to come under heightened scrutiny with all their further requests, all their other vouchers, that in their mind, the court sees them as a person who is making frivolous requests to the court. Um, that is the culture that we need to change in our district. One of the things that we do have easy access to is interpreters. Uh, we don't have to seek permission beforehand. We don't have to file a motion. We just go get the interpreters and then we can use them and they do their own CJA billing. For paralegals, for investigators at the beginning of the case, if there were some similar pooling of available services or service providers that the panel members could go to, I think that would make it much easier for the panel members to access those services. And I don't know whether it would be the Federal Defender's Office who could help coordinate that, uh, but making it easier to get these services I think would change the culture a bit. It's also the act of having to go to the court and ask for permission. Neither the government nor the federal defenders have to ask for approval or specifically justify how an investigator is necessary to adequately defend their <coughs> client. And that's often hard to articulate in the beginning of a case. Uh, and so I think making access to investigators and paralegals uh, would go a long way to our districts using them more. And then very briefly, the other place that I wanted to turn to has to do with the strain that high document and high data cases are putting on the CJA panel. Uh, it, it is so easy now through a grand jury subpoena or a search warrant for a cell phone or a computer to collect just incredible amounts of data. Uh, and the government is, in most cases, collecting huge amounts of documents and data. And I'm sensitive to the government when they say, we're not dumping this on you, we're producing this to you because this is what we've gathered in our investigation. And I believe that it's a production, not a dump. But it still means that in routine cases, an attorney is seeing you know, 10 to 250,000 pages uh, plus the data that's coming through. And for the attorney that has a secretary in his time, it, it can be a monumental task just to triage it. And so I, what I'd like to see is, some way that we start to use either uh, data search providers or ESI trained paralegals uh, to encourage the use of those things. And if 
nothing else, if this committee were to make a recommendation that for high document cases, um, that production of those include some rough index that generally describe the nature of the information and the source of the information, I think that would go a long way in cutting down the amount of time that panel attorneys and defense attorneys spend in just triaging it. And I will say that the Federal Defender's Office, FD.org, has an excellent go-by that I've seen setting out different categories for an ESI uh, production. And so I think that is one place where there's a meaningful opportunity <coughs> to cut down and really contain costs and also benefit defendants uh, in our districts. Thank you. Mr. Marcus. Thank you, Judge Cardone and Mr. Khan and the rest of the committee. Thank you very much for uh, having these hearings and listening to us. I know it's been two long days and, and uh, we appreciate uh, the committee's time and effort in this, in this matter, in this very important matter. You know, I was trying to think which David Bowie song to quote to start <laughs> off with today, whether it was Changes or Rebel Rebel. And I couldn't decide which was more appropriate, so I decided instead to quote uh, a more important luminary, Kathy Williams. Um, and in Kathy Williams' written testimony, and uh, she's talked about this many times, she said that uh, defenders, indigent defenders, are the red-headed, freckle-faced, jug-eared, buck-toothed, bastard stepchildren of the federal judiciary. Um, and she's, she's well known for talking about that, and she's, she's right in every single respect except one. And that is, we're no longer children anymore. Uh, the CJ Act was passed over 50 years ago, and it's time that we got some independence. We're all grown up now. And I know this has been a theme over the past two days uh, about indigent defense uh, independence, and you've heard some of that this afternoon on this panel, and I'd be happy to answer questions about that as well. The other topic, and Mr. Jones just spoke about this, that I addressed in my written testimony was discovery and how important I think uh, that issue is right now. It used to be for many years when I started out as a public defender that we couldn't get any information out of the government and most of the motion practice was filed, uh, was, was about, you know, how can we get the government to produce anything to us? We couldn't get document number one. Now we have the complete opposite problem, which is uh, getting truckloads of documents compressed onto a hard drive. And, and, and besides the absurdity of, of this, I mean, it really is uh, silly um, that, we don't, that we're not told exactly what the government intends to use in its case in chief. Putting aside the, the absurdity of that, uh, it costs the CJA lawyers and the CJA Act so much money um, that this is an opportunity for us to really cut down on costs and make the system more fair. Um, whether it's changing the rules um, and, uh, and recommending that, the, that Rule 16 be changed because it's long overdue for a change, or employing some of the methods that Mr. Jones talked about, um, it is time that we, we start to look at uh, the discovery practices of the government and, and um, how in recent years it's just impossible to to review that discovery in a way that you can effectively represent your client. Thank you. Um, Judge Walton, would you like to start the questioning? Sure. Um, Mr. Jones, you yes. talked about the culture that exists uh, in your district and you think uh, some past practices of uh, the judiciary has had a chilling impact and therefore things aren't being done that should be done, requests aren't being made that should be made. You mentioned one way you thought conceivably uh, that could be addressed, but what do you think this committee could recommend that would have a impact on what's taking place in that regard in your district? I think the two things, Judge. There was some data that was shared during one of the meetings yesterday, and so I think this committee could set up a body that would create that data and then share that data with the panel representatives. I think if it was widely known in our district that 1% of CJA attorney cases were using experts, that that is something that the chief district court judge and the panel rep and the federal defender would want to address, and I think they could address it through training. 
Uh, and I think also that this committee could have recommendations or require certain training uh, on the use of experts and obtaining experts. Uh, but also I think what the committee could do is to reduce the standard by which the judges are determining whether or not an investigator or an expert is necessary. Uh, there's an inherent difficulty, as another people have said, it, with judges evaluating whether or not it's necessary in a case, and it's often difficult to articulate exactly the benefit, and oftentimes an expert tells you exactly what the government expert tells you, and you've now eliminated you know, that possible defense. But I think if the judge were asked whether or not this is a clearly frivolous request, uh, and if it's clearly frivolous, deny it, and if it's not clearly frivolous, accept it, uh, that that would go a long way to increasing uh, the number of experts that were being sought and used in our district. I also think that raising the cap before circuit approval is necessary would go a long way to getting psychiatrists, psychologists, and mitigation experts involved in a case. Uh, the process, our district moves very quickly, and from arraignment to trial is often 30 days. Uh, and from plea to sentencing is often two months. And the process of getting circuit approval is a cumbersome one, uh, and it can take time. And I think if that amount were raised to $5,000 or $5,500 before circuit approval was necessary, that would go a long way. It would cut some of the red tape, uh, and it would encourage our panel members to use uh, those types of experts more. Ms. Verbeck, you indicated that uh, you thought that uh, <coughs> there was a respect for a full throttle uh, defense when it was someone who was of means, but the same perspective or mentality doesn't exist when it comes to representing poor people. What do you attribute that to as far as what you see in that regard in your district? Well, it comes down to having to beg for resources. Um, my clients, my private clients can pay without having to go to the court and request um, a forensic accountant or a paralegal or any number of things that would be necessary to a complex case defense. Um, on the contrary, when I represent someone in a complex case who is a CJA defendant, I have to beg for these things and as I believe Mr. Jones uh, indicated in the beginning of the case it's often very difficult um, I'm retained generally much earlier um, in a white-collar case uh, by a private client um, I know about the investigation I know what documents have been seized from my client I know who's been interviewed in the corporation I know all these types of things whereas in a CJA case I meet the client for the first time at their first appearance or arraignment. I don't know anything about the investigation. I don't know whether I'm going to be getting, you know, one CD or two terabytes worth of, of discovery material. And it becomes difficult to really assess what you're going to need in the early stages of the case. So that's, that's one problem. But I would just like to say that it's, it's interesting to me listening to the perspectives of people from so many different districts because the things that I'm hearing people uh, uh, raise as problems in their district are so far ahead of where my district is. Um, I, I, I did submit written testimony and if you've uh, had a chance to review it, you can see that in my di district, um, the, the judges have maintained complete and total control over every aspect of the CJA. There's no independent administrator, there's no independent CJA committee, there's no review of, of lawyers, who, no substantive review of lawyers who want to be on the panel. Um, basically, the criteria for admission to the panel is that you've practiced two years in any kind of law practice, sinkhole lawyering or, you know, title review, um, and you've taken one CLE on the sentencing guidelines, um, and you can be on the panel, and you can represent a federal felony defendant facing, you know, 10 to life. And that, that's 
that's a problem so fundamental, I think, and so far behind all of these other quite reasonable and, and necessary um, recommendations that Mr. Jones has, has made that um, you know we, we, we just are we are just so far behind and yet each time I, I've been on the panel for over 20 years and both formally and informally we have requested the judges to uh, to put some sort of independent review over the panel to call the panel because it's much too big uh, for the needs of indigent defense in my district. So what that means is that uh, new lawyers to the panel, and they're constantly coming on the panel, uh, they might get a case once every year, twice every year, so they have no uh, incentive to really keep up with federal criminal practice or pay uh, $400 to go to a United States Sentencing Guidelines seminar or keep their skills up. So um, that's a problem. And when they come to court and they don't know what they're doing, the judges are appropriately offended. And therefore, they don't trust any of the lawyers on the panel um, because they don't know you. They don't, they don't know you. You've been in front of them once. This is your first appearance and you know, you're doing a poor job. Um, so as a consequence, the judges who do know you continue to appoint the same lawyers over and over again. Um, you know, in the last five years, six years of my practice, um, all my cases were in front of the same judge. Um, and because they were big white collar cases, all my CJA cases, big white collar cases that the judge knew and trusted that I could manage, the judge appreciated a vigorous defense, and so I benefited from that favoritism, but it's not right. And it doesn't give, and now I'm retired, who's taking my place? It doesn't give the new panel lawyers the opportunity to become me, um, and that's not right. So um, I just, I think that the problems in my district, frankly, are the problems of the judges not wanting to let go of any authority whatsoever. And when the panel lawyers know that the judges have complete authority, frankly, there's you know an intimidation factor. Um, they don't want to offend the judge. They don't want to ask for too much. They want to be sure that maybe they'll be called next time, so they don't want to take up too much time, file too many motions. That, that's not right. Just one other question, Ms. Copeland. You, don't, you said you're one of the few districts that doesn't have a federal defender. Uh, are there any negative consequences uh, as a result of that? Uh, and do you think there should be a requirement that each district have uh, at least one federal defender? Thank you, Judge Walton, for asking that question. I, I am sitting up here listening. Uh, I feel like Ms. Reback, but to an extreme, that's and not to minimize anybody's concerns, but sometimes I feel like I'm hearing that the air conditioner won't go below 75 degrees and we're struggling with how to get clean drinking water <laughs> in my district. Um, it is tough to get adequate and effective Criminal Justice Act representation unless you just get lucky in my district. There is no federal defender. I think you, I, I'm sure you've read my testimony. For a while, it was anyone who was admitted to practice in the Southern District of Georgia, anyone. Uh, bankruptcy lawyers. I used to be an assistant U.S. attorney. I was the appellate chief for 10 years. It created this strange relationship between the prosecutors and the defense attorneys. You know, I'm not telling you what to do, but you may want to see if a suppression motion's good because there was a traffic stop in this case. You know, <laughs> that sort of relationship. Uh, I even talked kind of on the on the down low with some AUSAs in, in my district, and a little bit that still goes on now because there is no gatekeeping function whatsoever. I think I became a member of my district CJA panel by sending an email to the magistrate judge's deputy saying, sure, put me on the CJA panel. I mean, I, I think it was about that official of a process. Uh, there is still some desire to help out people who need it by the assistant U.S. attorneys pointing people in the right direction. I think I cited some cases in my written submission about uh, 
somebody who was an insurance defense attorney and decided to try some cases, a great insurance defense attorney, I'm not taking anything away from this person, but decided to get involved in criminal defense cases, gets assigned to something with a life sentence and, and pleads out his client to a life sentence. And you know, you're sitting there and you're hearing this and you're thinking it's, it's really not gonna get worse, baby. You know, you, you, can, you can go to trial on these cases and, and see what happens. Uh, I get emails sometimes from clients, at, or not clients, I'm sorry, other attorneys asking me questions about how to proceed forward. I've seen cases where, uh, I've been an attorney for 24 years, people out of law school for six months are trying cases on federal felonies with a 25 year cap. It just is kind of whoever gets a phone call from the deputy clerk that day. There's no gatekeeping function, there's no strata of qualifications within our system as to who handles what. And there's also the fact that the, the district court bench and the, the U.S. Attorney's Office traditionally have been very chummy. I was benefited from it when I was there, but there are, for instance, these court family picnics that the U.S. Attorney's Office goes to with the entire court staff. They work out at the same gym, things like that. I, talked to some other panel attorneys in my district who were really upset about that same gym thing. But I'll tell you where it really filters down sort of a lack of an independent agency. Uh, this, within the last year, I believe almost a year ago to the day, the U.S. Attorney's Office disclosed that an ATF agent and a prosecutor had had an affair that ran for a number of years and it was extramarital on both sides and it may have affected up to 400 cases in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And the U.S. Attorney's Office first sends an ex parte communication to the judge. The judge publishes it and says, we're not doing it this way. Here are all the names of the cases that are involved in this, potentially. And the U.S. Attorney's Office sets forth its analysis as to why there's really no problem with these cases and everything's great. Uh, I get appointed on four of the cases, ended up it wasn't so great in those cases and ended up getting some substantial relief from my client. I also got, as part of that kind of broom function, if you will, cleaning up, I also got carte blanche from the chief judge of the district. If you become aware of any other cases to which I need to appoint you, please let me know. I will appoint you on these cases. That is great, I love that. but. It would have been nice if we'd had somebody who could have had two or three weeks to pull files and sit at the U.S. Attorney's Office and say, show me these cases that you're talking about, you know. Trust but verify, if, if nothing else, just to kind of go through everything so that you could have seen if the analysis was correct, if there were really other cases that should have been identified. Now, catastrophic events don't happen like that terribly often, and this is a good thing. I think we're all glad about that, but sometimes bad things happen, and it would be nice if you had an agency that could be devoted to that. But it, it just gets difficult sometimes in my district to sometimes see uh, the quality of representation. I, um, Do you know why a federal defender's office was never created in your district? Judge, I, I know all sorts of scurrilous rumors and <laughs> muck and muck. Uh, there was Detail. one, and uh, sit closer, Amy Lee. There, there was one a, a number of years ago, and then it just was closed down. And it has, I've been in, uh, practicing in that district for almost 24 years, and during the time I've been practicing in the Southern District of Georgia, there has not been a federal defender's office. Um, and like I put in my note, there, it used to be everybody. I mean, you would get, you would lose your admission to the Southern District of Georgia bar if you told a judge you were not qualified to represent criminal defendants. And that has changed with our new chief judge who has made it a volunteer on me, but I would like for it to go a step further, perhaps with a gatekeeping system, you know, a power ranking system, whatever, whatever you want to call it, just so that if you want to become a criminal defense attorney, and I, and I get that we all have to start someplace, but why don't we start with base cases as opposed to life in prison sex trafficking cases that it seems to be a, a little bit way, better way to work your way up the system. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. McBride. Thanks, Ruben, and uh, welcome to the panelists. Thank you for uh, your presence here today, for your written testimony, which we've all uh, read, and, and your um, 
your willingness to uh, engage with us. Um, I, I want to start with a, a, a question on, I think, one of the sort of first principles that we've been thinking about as a committee that, um, uh, you know, I, I think we're still trying to figure out exactly how to, how to approach in the face of an anecdotes in many instances, which, which can vary across the spectrum. And I'll, I'll, I'll set the stage this way. When, when I was leaving to come down to join my fellow committee members, my nine-year-old said, now, Dad, what's this committee you're on and what is it doing? And I said, well, it's, it's basically sort of a report card for how judges and defense lawyers get along. And he said, well, what, what grade are you going to give them? And I said, well, it's, it's really challenging. I think the judges you know, are giving out A's and A minuses to the relationship, and the defense counsel are giving out you know, C pluses or Fs. And uh, Alistair said, wow, that's, that's a big difference. You know, how are you going to figure that out? And I said, you know, talk to me uh, in November, and uh, we'll let you know how we come out with it. But, you know, all kidding aside, we, we have heard, um, you know, stories uh, from defense counsel that describe a, you know, pathologically dysfunctional, broken system in their districts. And we've talked, um, and not just to judges, to be fair, we've talked to, uh, you know, panel attorneys or, or defenders who have a much uh, describe a much more uh, uh, positive and healthy and functional relationship. And, um, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, and it may be that we just have a crazy quilt uh, across 94 districts, and things look very different. And even by division, things may be different. I, I was U.S. attorney in a district that had four divisions, and it sometimes felt like four mini districts within one division in, in lots of different respects. And so one, one question um, that I wanted to start with at it builds on a question that uh, Professor Gould asked earlier and that um, Judge Walton was engaging with Mr. Jones about, and that is, are there uh, objective, if you will, uh, criteria or, or statistics or sort of benchmarks that we can look to that may be a proxy, um, a somewhat dependable proxy for how healthy or independent the CJA panel is? And, and the one that Mr. Jones mentioned is the, um, uh, the use or the, the, the percentage time that uh, outside experts uh, are approved for CJA cases. And so just in the interest of, of time, I'll, I'll direct, um, I'll sort of move across, maybe start with Mr. Marcus and, and, and move over to Mr. Ayers. Um, is that an example of something that you think may actually be a portal into uh, the independence or strength of a CJA panel? Um, and if not, well, whether it is or not, are there other similar things that you would point to that we as a committee could look at to help, you know, get below sort of the anecdotes? Sure. And, and I'll start by saying it seems like you had a much healthier talk with your nine-year-old uh, than I did with my, this morning. My, my debate with my nine-year-old this morning was about whether she would eat the waffle for breakfast or not. And you had a debate <laughs> about uh, grading judges and CJA lawyers. Um, you know, I, I think that's a really, really difficult question about how to judge that. And maybe I, I want to fight the premise a little bit and say th that's a reason why we need more independence from the judiciary. Because I think it is so hard to come up with objective criteria like that. And I think each district you're going to hear something so different and it may be the learned helplessness that we, that we heard about from Mr. Jones' district where people don't even ask, so the, the statistics may be skewed, uh, where in this district, um, uh, you know, it, it gets approved sort of, some judges are great and some judges are awful and it's really a judge by judge uh, basis. So I, I'm not sure that you're gonna find criteria that work certain, certainly nationally and even district by district, I think you're gonna run into all sorts of problems like that. And I think that's, you know, I've been listening, I've been watching online, these guys are doing a great job over here. I've been watching a lot of the testimony and I think one of the themes that has come across is the, the panel really has to answer to the judiciary now. We have to, as Mr. Rebeck said, beg a lot of times for what we want. Um, and I think that's the real problem, and I, and I don't think that there are criteria that we can come up with that's going to that's gonna really come out and show that, um, other than sort of talking to people who are on the line like, like me and the other lawyers. And at least what my feeling is, is that if we can create more of an independence where we work 
with the public defender's office um, to deal with experts and investigators and, and so on, um, I think you're going to get um, a lot better representation than we get now. And you know, it's funny, I, I, I heard you know, judges don't want to let go of this control, which, which is so true. That's, that's but, but then when you talk to judges about the CJ, they love to complain about having to review bills right. and review these requests. I mean, you know, I love to complain too um, <laughs> about stuff, and then I don't want to give up control either. I mean, I, you know, it, it's, I think it's in our nature. We want to keep control and we want to complain about it. It, right, so I think you guys are in in a great position to sort of objectively get us out from under that that control in a way that we don't have to beg anymore. Um, the criteria, the objective criteria, I, I think is going to be very very difficult, Mr. McBride. Maybe maybe some other people have different answers, but I think that's going to be difficult. Let, can I just add one thing very quickly? In my district, we have a model CJA plan. We've had it for years. It's been readopted any number of times. The last time was 2011. We have it, but the judges of my district totally ignore it. Uh, it has different things on it about criteria for admission to the panel. There's supposed to be a mentor panel. Uh, you're supposed to have a three-year review. They don't do any of that. Uh, and so it seems to me that as long as we are, as long as we are under the, the thumb of the judiciary, who, who within the system ha has the authority to tell an Article III judge they're doing it wrong? I mean, they just, they don't care. Yeah, you know? it, it, it's a great question, and, and I don't pretend that maybe this committee can tell judges they're doing it wrong, but, but armed with what you just said, Ms. Reback and Mr. Marcus, let me quickly ask Mr. Ayers, and, and just to, at the risk of restating the question, um, I, I didn't mean to suggest that if, um, if approval ratings on expert witnesses went from 1%, as is the case in one district Professor Gould told us about, you know, to 80%, that that solves the question of the first principle as to whether that's still the right structure. But if it turns out, and I'm just kind of making up the numbers to pose the question, if a third of all districts only have a 10%, a maximum of a 10% approval rate on expert witnesses for CJA cases, does that not sort of make Ms. Rebeck's point perhaps that there's just something fundamentally broken that um, it's, it's the exception, not the rule, that, that lawyers like you are getting the resources you need at least some of the time in some of the complicated cases, you know, to, to vigorously, zealously defend your client? I can only speak from my own experience. Um, and I, I was a panel representative and I would go to some of these meetings and, and just hear these stories about how things are different in other districts. And, and my assumption is things run much more efficiently sometimes in my district probably because of Mr. McNamara or the person that ran the defender's office ahead of that, but I, don't, I just don't see how you can do that quantitatively or some measurement. I can tell you I've done a variety of different cases, uh, terrorism cases and some other cases, and I've never had uh, a judge deny my request for an expert. I've had some comments about the quality of my motion and had to go back and do homework and things of that nature, but, but that, that's to be expected. But uh, I just don't have a negative experience to, to, to share with, with the panel. I mean, in terrorism cases, I've had a number of experts where I've asked for them, and as long as you substantiated your request with the appropriate facts and the need, I, I've just never had a bad experience. So uh, I just can't speak to these other districts or or measurements or, or complaints, to be honest. Okay. Mr. Chairman, do I have I just, time for one more question? Yeah, if not, I will. Okay. We're doing well. Go ahead. So a quick question uh, to Mr. Jones and, and Ms. Copeland. You're both former AUSAs. Uh, I'm a former AUSA. I, I um, uh, for better or worse, have spent most of my career in um, the Justice Department, have not been a CJA attorney before. I, I will confess that as an AUSA, even as a United States attorney, I spent, you know, zero time thinking about all of the issues that you guys have spoken about this morning and that we've heard about for the last two days. Now maybe that's as it should be because the idea is to keep prosecutors very far away from that process. So, so uh, 
least I hope that was the answer. Otherwise, you know, statement against interest, I never thought about it. But um, I, I will say that intuitively, as a young prosecutor, um, while we didn't like, you know, losing to good defense counsel, there was part of us that always liked it when a really good defense counsel, uh, when we were up against a really good defense counsel, whether that was an FPD, uh, an AFPD, um, a, a CJA lawyer, or, or, you know, just a retained counsel. And so the question is, in, in your guys' minds as former assistants, is there any, as a committee, should we be thinking about any potentially constructive role that the Justice Department uh, can play in strengthening um, you know, the funding and administration of, of, of the indigent defense. And, and I don't mean by necessarily taking over the program, but do you see any role for, you know, trying to leverage um, the Justice Department? As Judge Cardone said earlier today, after all, it's called the Department of Justice. It's the only executive branch agency with a moral virtue in its title. It's not the Department of Incarceration. It's not the Department of Conviction. In theory, it should care a lot about these issues. And um, so just, just curious if, if you have any reflections. Well, I, I believe that all prosecutors want a good defense attorney on the other side of the aisle. And I think they know that the system only works when everybody is zealously represented. Um, earlier, I, I mentioned the ESI production. And I think that might be one place where DOJ guidelines could help defense attorneys um, in sifting through that data. If getting through it was easier because of an index, I think that's a place where we could see real benefit. Another panel member earlier said that in their district, the United States attorneys and the AUSAs will provide a list of hot docs. Um, that can be useful. Reverse proffers can be useful. Uh, but there's a, a grain of skepticism that needs to be taken with everything that the government has given you because that might be the most important documents to them, but your defense might you know, focus on a different subset of documents. Um, but other than, than that example and sifting through discovery, I'm not sure that I, I can think of right now any specific examples where a change in DOJ policy that would increase the representation for defendants, except perhaps to say that I get the sense that a lot of AUSAs feel differently about sentencing versus guilt or innocence. Uh, and once guilt is established, the prosecutors are often going for you know, high-end or large you know, sentences. And when defense attorneys come in and offer arguments and mitigation about childhood trauma, about mental health issues, and are asking for a variant sentence, is I, I often feel like the government is pointing to the criminal record that often has you know, drug use and violence in it and saying there's a disparity there between what each party wants. And so I, I don't know if there's a place where the priorities of the DOJ could be changed there, but that's a place where I, I think there's a difference between prosecutors and defense attorneys about what the right punishment is after someone's already been adjudicated guilty. Ms. Coble? I was the Department of Justice employee from January 16, 2000 until September 25, 2009, and I thought about the issue of good defense counsel every single day on that job. Uh, I was the appellate chief, which meant that I handled the appellate work, and I also handled either directly or in a supervisory fashion, but mostly directly, the 2255 claims and the ineffective assistance of counsel petitions. As a result, I became the mother confessor of our entire district. I got calls from attorneys who were so stressed out because they had no idea what they were doing and why they were representing a felon in possession on gun charges when they were trying to put together a bond offering. True story. Uh, you know, my, my colleagues at the time were keenly aware of the limitations and in preparing for my remarks today, I knew I'd arrived when one of them told me that they really didn't feel the need to be real friendly to me anymore in court, you know, so, uh, but there is a whole, a whole thought that they do need to kind of look out for the person who may or may not be truly adept at criminal defense attorney. Yes, I always love seeing a good attorney. It would raise, raise my game, and I, I really appreciated that. I think the only thing that would concern me about the Department of Justice carrying any of the burden is that with most of my indigent defendant clients, they are extremely distrustful of anyone that they think of as the man. 
and I think that the DOJ is, is in fact the man, and I, wouldn't, I would have trouble if I were ever called upon to explain to them, telling them why exactly the Department of Justice who was prosecuting them was also trying to help them to. Um, that would just be something I think that would be poorly received. Could, could I just uh, speak really quickly on that issue? Because I think it's important. I'll give you the other perspective, because um, I've never been a prosecutor or worked for the Department of Justice. Um, and, and I feel strongly that it, it, we should keep the two separate. I mean, it's an adversary system. And I think it would be a huge mistake to um, have the Department of Justice uh, involved in the Criminal Justice Act. Um, really, really, uh, I think it would, it would cause a problem for the reasons that Ms. Copeland stated and, and for just optics reasons. And, and I don't think it would be in the best interest of our clients or indigent defense. It, yes, it's called the Department of Justice, but, but the reality is we go to court every day fighting with uh, prosecutors, and, and it's, it's a, you know, it, it should be a fair, good fight, but we are fighting with them, and we are adversaries with them. And so I think it'd be a real mistake to, to try to solve the CJA problems by involving the Department of Justice. I think one perfect example is, you know, we've seen the recent memos that have come out from the Attorney General about Brady and Giglio, about how the policy should change with line prosecutors disclosing it uh, more readily. Um, but the Department of Justice has fought very hard against any actual rule change with Brady and Giglio. They just want to give this advice to line prosecutors, which line prosecutors are free to disregard, and many, many, as we see every day, disregard it. So um, yes, it's a nice name, but in reality, we're adversaries, and, and uh, as we should be. Thanks. Thank you. One of the difficult problems we've had in doing this, having these hearings, gathering this evidence, is that a lot of what we're trying to wrap our, our hands around, if you will, is cultural and anecdotal. And if, I'll give you an example, the issue of self-reduction of vouchers. There's nothing that we can't get any evidence of that actual numbers and how many people reduce their vouchers. We can't get any numbers, uh, any data, if you will, as to how many folks, how many attorneys just don't make requests for expert services because they've made them over and over again and they haven't, and they've been denied or because, uh, as one of you was saying earlier, that they were concerned that there are, other vouchers would receive heightened scrutiny if they made these requests and were denied. So we really have no choice but to just to ask you about your own districts and to ask you to tell us what you know about the, this information because we can't get those statistics. So Mr. Ayers, I'm, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, we, we've heard certainly from Tom McNamara and we know about your district and I know that it's a very good district. But we also know that um, there are vouchers that are cut. And one of the things I want to ask you about is a few minutes ago when you testified, you said sometimes your voucher would get cut and the judge would cut it and that was fine. And it was just very much, at least I got the impression, it was very much like that's the way it is and I'll move on from that. In your written testimony, you indicated that um, you didn't necessarily think it was fair. I think the implication was you had done the work, but you weren't going to be compensated for it. So I want you to um, just address that, but I also would like you to address the issue of self-reduction. I know that you don't choose to do that yourself, but uh, my question is more about the other attorneys in your district that you know do do it and why. The topic of self-reduction is, is just people or lawyers have told me that they do that and that they'll reduce vouchers and, that, and they've told me that as lawyers, not just from my district, I specifically remember from other districts where they've done that on their own accord. I just don't think it's a good practice because, uh, I mean, I'm a business major. I keep meticulous track of my time because, uh, for, because I have to send in a voucher or CJA appointed case. But the vast majority of my cases are, are civil cases and my client expects 
for me to have the time written down in those cases. And uh, I oftentimes reduce civil bills as part of being in business. It's a good practice with your clients if they raise an issue. And I don't expect that not to happen just because I'm doing the CJA case, to be honest. Um, I like a little feedback. Uh, the cutting of vouchers used to be uh, take place a lot more often uh, in my mind than it does now when I first started this. The rates were much lower, but the time's always been kind of the same in my mind. It takes a significant amount of time to meet with people that don't trust you to try to get them to do what's in their best interest, uh, and uh, that's never going to change. I mean, they, when they meet me, they don't, they don't hire me like my civil clients do. They, they feel like they're stuck with me, and, and I have to be a wee bit of a salesman uh, to try to address those issues uh, from that standpoint. But over the last year, for example, uh, I probably had three or four vouchers uh, cut, uh, and it could be a little bit longer time, but several of those, I got a letter from the judge saying that we, we just don't feel like you justified your fees, with it, which of course would aggravate anybody whose fees have been reduced in my mind, uh, but they went through the pains of taking a letter, probably a uh, commentary prepared by Mr. McNamara, and said, you know, you should have spent more time in your letters. The one thing I can't stand doing is writing letters to justify fees and filling out a CJA 26 form after I've turned in timesheets and I've turned in the spreadsheets and Excel sheets. And to be honest, about time that I review a bill, I'm probably two to three or four months past the conclusion of that case that started usually, I would say, a year before or eight months before. And so I, I, I really don't personally like going back and reviewing it, but I do send letters in. It's just uh, generally I rely on my timesheets because of the detail that I put in there. Now, Mr. McNamara, I, I like Mr. McNamara. He's been doing this for a long time, but he's got a job to do. He's got to justify every voucher that goes to a judge. So he's got to justify it to the four circuit judges when, whenever it's above the, the limit. So I know that, but I, I, just, I just don't like writing the letters. I understand this part of the process. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll spend time on them sometimes. But I, and I've had significant vouchers that were paid, that were budgeted. I think one case I had to budget where there was never an issue and it was paid and it, it was a lot of money. It was a terrorism case. Did you do the work, sir? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but. <laughs> I mean, that's, isn't that the standard? Whether or not you did the work. I mean, the way you say it, it's like they, they paid you, but you did the work. All right. Yeah, it, so I, I, I'm not trying to get into it with you, but I, I, I just, you know, it seems like you're justified if you did the work. But here's my question. So is it mostly a business decision for you then at that point, instead of going back and forth and trying to convince them that you should get paid for the work that you did, it's just easier to just kind of move forward? Absolutely. In every case. And, and if I feel that someone's written a letter that I disagree with, I'll, I'll respond. I mean. My job is to represent my clients, and secondly is uh, I think I should be paid. And, and when I represent my clients, whether it's for these expert services or anything else, if I want something, I'll ask for it, and, and I'll do it respectfully with the court. Same thing with uh, vouchers and things of that nature. Nine times out of ten, I don't have anything to say. On, on some occasions, I don't ever know why they're cut and I'd get no explanation and that's not going to change. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I can beat a dead horse and, and I can throw gas on the fire or I mean, it's just like a civil case when my client comes in and says... Are you doing business? Yeah, sure. I mean, right. that's, that's, I mean, that's happens in every kind of case I've ever done. Thank you. Mr. Jones, uh, let me just ask you a question. Uh, you had said earlier, you were talking a little bit about um, the vouchers and the heightened scrutiny of the vouchers. We were talking specifically, I think, about expert vouch expert requests and folks not asking for experts because they had been denied a number of times and they didn't want the court to give them a, a heightened scrutiny in the future. That heightened scrutiny you were referring to, would that be on their attorney vouchers 
Is that what you were referring to? It was. Um, and I think, and this is also sort of an answer to Mr. McBride's question, I don't think that you can do a data-driven analysis of the CJ panel and determine the health of the panel in any given district. And if you look at the middle district CJ expert rates, I also have to say that in the last four or five years, I haven't asked for uh, an investigator, and I've gone and done it myself. And I haven't asked for a paralegal, and I've done the work myself, and have mostly been compensated for it. And so I don't think that even where you see an outlier that that represents subpar representation of defendants in that district. Um, and so I think it's hard to equate data with the services that the clients are getting in that district. And I'll also say we have a chief district judge and a CJA panel rep and a federal public defender who all are all very conscientious and do a great job representing defendants. So I don't think even that data point uh, accurately demonstrates or represents the health of the panel in that district. Um, Ms. Rowe, as to your question, I don't know that other panel attorneys would express it as I've expressed it, that they would say, I'm afraid that if Judge X denies me here, that when I submit other vouchers, they're going to give me that scrutiny. But I think the act of having to go and ask for the money and then being denied creates that type of relationship. You're always asking for something from the court. And it leads to things like self-cutting. Um, it leads to things, as we heard, I think, somebody else say in the last panel, where if you spend four hours trying to get the production to work on your computer and can't do it, you don't submit it. If you have to print it and you have 5,000 pages, you aren't submitting requests for those copies. Um, I have self-cut my voucher as a business decision because I've looked at the time that I thought it would take me to file the CJA 26 and to work with the district court judge and the amount of money that was involved. Uh, and sometimes it's been $1,000, sometimes it's been three or $4,000, but I've made that decision. I don't think in the middle district, though, we have a large problem with the district court judges cutting vouchers. I know that his, it has happened, but I don't think it happens frequently. I think when they are cut, the judges are doing a very conscientious job uh, in so doing. In the Western District, the vouchers that I've had cut have been cut at the circuit level. The district court judge sent a reasonableness letter that said this is a reasonable fee, and it was cut at the circuit level. Um, so I don't think in either the middle or the West we have a large problem with, with voucher cutting, though it does happen. Just as a follow-up, when the circuit did cut the voucher, was there any kind of due process? There was. Um, there, I was sent a letter uh, and was allowed to write back and respond. Uh, and I did an analysis, and they actually modified the cut. So I explained why it spent X amount of time in that case, and it was a large RICO case with multiple defendants and hundreds of hours of wiretap communications, and they, they didn't meet me in the middle, but they gave me more than they had initially said they would with the cut. Thank you. Hi, um, we're gonna get follow-up questions from the panel and then from other members of the committee who haven't had a chance. But I'd actually add, like to ask one question just so I can understand something. And I look, as a public defender, um, I know what I do when um, I need an investigator or when one of my lawyers needs an investigator and needs a psychologist or whatever. But it occurred to me as I listened to you talk, I don't really know what you do. What do you put in your application when at the beginning of the case you've gotten, you know, initial discovery, maybe it's, you know, a small case and you've got a pile of, you know, 302s that's only like this, but, you know, you, maybe you've got a bunch of events and you need a timeline and you need to figure out what's what and you need to develop an investigative plan. What do you put in a, in, in a motion for appointment of an investigator? And I, David, how about you start with? I, I think it depends on the judge. Um, if we have a good judge, you've heard from some of them uh, in the last two days, you can put very little and, and you know we'll get approved. Although, you know, you have to decide, are you going to ask for, how, how much are you gonna ask for? And, and that takes time. If you're gonna ask initially to bust the cap uh, and you need circuit approval, well, well shoot, it's gonna take uh, some time to get that approved. Um, don't I want to get the investigator working right away? I may ask for a little less because I know I need that investigator quickly and then ask later to, to go over the cap. 
Um, but but with, with the good judges, you can put a lot less and just say, you know, it's a complex case. Here's how many defendants. Here's how many documents I've been provided. Here's how many witnesses I need to interview uh, and, and, and put those sorts of things. Um, with, a, with a less sympathetic judge, um, you're going to have to get a lot more detailed, which obviously is, is a problem for, for lots of reasons. And one of the reasons I think we, to go back and beating this dead horse, for, for independence of, of, of the panel, because having to go beg for uh, an investigator um, and lay out some of the things that you don't want to lay out early on um, is a big problem. So, so with good judges, you don't have to do, you don't have to lay out a whole lot. And, and, and that's generally the case here in this district. But there are some who are going to ask for very detailed explanations of why do you need this psychologist? And if you don't submit the report at the end from the psychologist at sentencing, well, <coughs> what did that report end up saying? That why aren't you? I spent the eight hundred dollars or whatever it was on that psychologist, and now you're not giving me the report. Well, hundred dollars, <laughs> whatever it was. That, that's okay. that's the cap, by the way. Whatever the cap is, uh, yeah. you know, we spent that money, um, and now I don't see the report attached. Uh, to your sentencing memo, so your guy must have been doing what? Um, so, you know, so th there's all sorts of problems. I know that's not answering your question, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, and, it's a problem. Let me, let me follow up with, on that just one more. So, so you talked about a psychologist. So I know when the requests come, from, come to me from a lawyer in my office, almost always the very first piece of useful information that they give me concerning the request has to do with, it's directly derived from attorney-client privilege communications. These are the impressions of my client based upon the meetings I've had with that individual. Obviously, this is matters that you shouldn't really be talking about to anybody. How do you deal with those requests? How do you justify to a judge, I want a psychologist because my client is giving me delusional information that leads me to suspect we've got a problem here? I think unless it's the, the most extreme case, lawyers are not asking. Uh, right. they're, they're just not asking for the psychologist unless it's such an extreme case where it's going to turn out that the client is incompetent or the client has a serious uh, issue um, that's obvious um, and it's going to be disclosed at some point. If it's, if it's anything other than that, the lawyers, at least my experience with myself and others, have been, you're just not going to ask for it. Right. Or an alibi. What if you need an investigator to investigate an alibi? And you don't want to tell the judge that. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. And, and David's right. It's totally dependent on the character of the judge. And it's a matter of trust and respect between the judges and the lawyers. There are some judges who understand the conflict, who will take a bare bones request and say, go and good luck. And there are other judges that want to just micromanage your defense and and that's just not appropriate well Matt while I have identified some problems with the CJA panel in my district I will say my judges are terrific to me I mean they are fantastic to deal with and I typically don't have to disclose too much one time I felt like I had to disclose more than I felt comfortable with and I asked for recusal of the magistrate judge from the case because he handles the discovery and the appointment issues and he recused himself and reassigned it to another magistrate judge, and that's how I handled it. And I, I too, was surprised that that worked, but it did. If, if that had happened in my district, no lawyer on the panel who ever hoped to get another case would ask for the <laughs> recusal of a magistrate, only because they're desperate, I guess, for CJA lawyers, you know, in her district. But, I mean, I can't imagine that ever happening in Tampa. Thank you. I want to give this. I guess, um, maybe, excuse my ignorance, but if you have, Mr. Marcus, an indication that your client may be incompetent, but you have questions about it, you're not going to No, in an, extreme, in an extreme case where, where there's a competency question, yes, but, but I think in the mine run of cases, the, the, the question isn't one of competence, but, you know, is there some factor that would help at sentencing or, or something that a psychologist could help me with? Um, as an advocate for a lower sentence or something like this, or an explanation for why he or she did what they did. In those cases, um, at least in CJA cases, I, I'm not asking. Competence is something different. I, I, that, that, that rarely comes up. But, 
But in my retained cases, a psychologist is almost a matter of, of course um, that I bring into as part of the team, um, either to help uh, the client and family through it, which I understand is not going to happen in a CJA case, or, or to explain some of the actions. Um, and, and it's amazing when you have the resources to do those sorts of things, what you can find out um, about explaining people's behavior. And um, with the 3553 factors, which I think, unfortunately, you see a huge difference in retained cases in the presentation of those factors to a district judge and CJA, and CJA cases and how those, uh, someone's behavior is explained at sentencing. And, and, and have you found that to be effective in causing the judge to give a sentence that otherwise may not be, uh, have been given? I, I have. Um, and, and I think um, I, I think this is a new era of sentencing, obviously. And we're just sort of scratching the surface of all the different lawyering that can happen. W what I've seen is a lot of, um, a lot of the old sort of mentality on sentencing still exists. You know, people still think, well, we're just going to go in and argue about sophisticated means or minor role. And there's whole new areas to argue and to explore. And I do think there's, there's room for, for some great lawyering there. Um, but, you know, if a CJ lawyer asked um, for some funds to put something like that together, um, even the good judges here in this district, I, I don't think would be, uh, would look upon that favorably. That's distressing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Any of the other panel members want to follow up before we? Well, so is, you mentioned, uh, David, the difference between the level of practice with regard to sentencing in particular for retained practice versus CJA work. And so is, is money really the issue? Or is it a structural issue? Is it a training issue? Or is it a combination of all three? Well, I don't, I don't think it's a money issue for the lawyer. In other words, I think the, I mean, it, you know, the lawyers um, are, are going to do the best they can. It's, it's, it's the resources available to the lawyer, whether it's going through the discovery, whether it's um, getting an expert or a paralegal or investigator, or, or just um, the structure itself. I, so, so yes, money is absolutely an issue. Um, and getting the resources is absolutely an issue to uh, effective representation of, of clients. And, and again, I think this goes back in a lot of ways to independence um, of criminal justice act lawyers. Um, because, and we've heard this and, and sort of I'm repeating it, but you know, the public defender doesn't need to go to a judge and ask for an investigator for lots of reasons. And we've heard some of them from Mr. Khan. Um, uh, Neither does the U.S. Attorney's Office. I mean, can you imagine the uproar if we told the government that they would have to go to a judge to get an extra agent um, to help go through discovery? I mean, it would the uproar it would it would be squashed in a millisecond. And yet here we are. We have to beg uh, for help to go through discovery. I mean, it's just. I mean, when you think about the disparity between um, the resources and just the ability to look at the documents in a case, it's, it's, it's incredible. It really is. So yes, um, money is, is absolutely an issue. And if we had, which we do not, if we had a sort of a CJA administrator like the South Carolina panelist earlier uh, discussed, um, we could go to that person and we could make our case for what we need. In my district, because we have no one like that and no committee, um, what winds up happening is lawyer, inexperienced lawyers, or even experienced lawyers who are unfamiliar with a particular judge, for example, <coughs> wind up calling around either to the CJA rep or 12, 15 years ago when the, the CJA model plan was first adopted and one of the magistrates did try to impanel a, a group of mentors. Um, I was one of them. Um, these are the people who would get called. And these people, the mentors, the CJA rep, they don't get paid. And they're, you know, they're being asked to volunteer to hold the hand of a new lawyer through an entire process 
whether it's case budgeting, whether it's what to put in a motion for resources, whether it's even whether to ask that particular judge, um, that takes a lot of time. We had an excellent CJA rep two times ago. Um, I canvassed the last three CJA, CJA reps in my division uh, before coming here in preparation for this testimony. And the one that was most effective for the panel, who offered the most help, the most guidance, who acted as an intermediary when vouchers got cut between the aggrieved lawyer and the judge who cut them, that person resigned after about 18 months or in 14 months in the position because he kept his time and recognized that it was taking approximately six hours a week of volunteer time to perform those functions because we don't have an intermediary. We don't have a CJA ad administrator. Um, somebody should be able to counsel. Lawyers should feel free to ask for advice about how to case budget, how to make requests for resources. But nobody should have to do that for free. That should be a paid CJA administrator. Other members of the committee, we have some questions you'd like to put? Uh, I was just going to ask a step further. I think I know the answer, but if you are retained, yay, you got some money, but it runs out. Have any of you ever gone and said, I need money for an expert, even though I was retained? There isn't sufficient money there for an expert. I need additional money, or I need to get appointed because the funds have run out. Have you, or do you know of anyone who's had that situation, and, and what was the result of that request? In my district, that has happened. Um, and what my understanding was that there was a hearing with the magistrate, an ex parte hearing. The lawyer had to disclose what they had been paid to date. Um, all their hours um, had to be disclosed. And if they were uh, above the, what, what they would have been paid as a CJA lawyer, then no further um, you know, payment was forthcoming. So that's for the fees. As far as the resources, I'm not aware of anybody um, asking for resources when the money has run out. I think people just feel like that would never be granted. In my district, you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. You gotta, you gotta quote it right, and you gotta get paid up front because that's it. Yeah, we have a local rule that says when you are a retained lawyer, you are retained through appeal. So, yes. you know, I mean, the, there's just that's it. In for a penny, in for a pound through appeal. Did the others have, have you had that experience in your district or heard of it or? I don't have anything to add. No. I, I have two questions. One has to do with experts. Um, I, the, the question is whether any of you know uh, yourselves or know of anyone who has asked for an expert and it's been denied and it's been taken up on appeal. So that's my first question. Does anyone know of a situation where you asked, you were a uh, uh, an anecdotally, someone you know asked for an expert. Um, it was denied. Um, the the person felt strongly enough that they took it up on appeal. And then, what was the result of the appeal? So that's my first question. Anybody? I don't know anybody who took it up on appeal. I don't know anybody that took it up on appeal either. As an assistant U.S. attorney, I worked on the government side of somebody who lost the expert battle and raised it on the direct appeal after the conviction and sentencing in a death penalty case. And they took it up on appeal. They, they, it was part of their direct appeal following the sentencing, yes. And, and what happened? They lost. They lost their request for an expert? Yes. Okay. They, they found that the judge acted within his discretion in denying the expert request. Okay. And the, the and just, just so I understand, was the cause of action for that claim a Sixth Amendment cause, or was it a I, statutory I, I don't even remember. I think it was a statutory one. The reported decision is United States versus Brown um, from the 11th Circuit, 2003 or four. And um, for those of you who know of, of being denied, um, do you know why it wasn't 
taken up on appeal or what, I mean, or why further action wouldn't be taken if, if it was denied and felt necessary? It was my, one was mine. Um, I had a case, um, a fraud case in the Middle District of Florida where there was also a concurrent SEC action in, uh, I think, the Southern District of Florida. And um, I asked for um, help from, I asked for a lawyer admitted in the Southern District of Florida to basically shadow um, our case so that the client I had in the Middle District of Florida could be represented in the SEC action in New York because there were things that were really going to affect his defense in Florida. And so I thought he should have an attorney appointed there consistent with maintaining his, his defense here. Um, and I was denied and, because he wasn't entitled to an attorney in the civil case there. And uh, the reason I didn't take it up on appeal is simply because I found someone I knew in New York, a, you know, a personal collegial relationship with an SEC lawyer up there who agreed to just advise informally. Um, and you know, while he didn't agree to put in an appearance in the SEC case, he would at least monitor it and advise me. And you know, I figured that was the best I was going to get. So. Mr. Mark, did you have any comment on that question, Mr. Marcus? I don't, Your Honor. I'm okay. Um, the the next question is just I'm gonna. I don't know if any of you were here this morning, but I mentioned that in the uh, District of uh, Puerto Rico they have some standing orders regarding vouchers and you, the submission of vouchers. I'm gonna read you two paragraphs from one of those standing orders, and then I would like any of you who wish to comment or would be willing to comment to comment. Um, the court finds it unconscionable and unacceptable for CJA counsel to invoice for that basic research and drafting. Council cannot seek compensation in case after case for researching what they already know or should know or for submitting in any motion or memorandum a generic recital of basic sentencing principles many times previously prepared by another attorney. Accordingly, effective immediately, CJ counsel shall not invoice for any research or drafting concerning basic sentencing principles. That research and drafting will not be compensated. Any comment? I'll comment on that. I mean, I think the intent of that rule is you should just bill for the real time that you have, right? So if you actually do research on what are the latest cases on um, uh, aberrant behavior in the First Circuit uh, um, after Booker, I, I would think even under that rule you could bill for that time. If you're just block quoting from your last sentencing memo, well, that, that I mean, that's not time that you're actually doing. It's just moving something over. So I don't think that's a, that, that needed to be said. CJ lawyers aren't going to bill for ghost time. They're only going to bill for real time. Now, if you're writing a new memo, you should be able to bill for that um, if it's the first time you're doing it. So you shouldn't be able to bill for recycling an old memo, but you certainly should be able to bill for writing a new one. Uh, so that would be my only critique of that rule, even if it's basic. If it's the first time you're doing it, you should be able to bill for it. I, ha I have something to add on that. I have two things to add. Number one, again, it goes back to this trust and respect between mm -hmm. the lawyers and the judge, that if the judges know the lawyers and the quality of their work and they're familiar with them, then, you know, generally, when they look at the voucher, they know whether innovative arguments and creative defenses and what have you have been made, and so they generally don't cut those vouchers. In my canvas of the CJA reps over the last few years, my understanding is that the vouchers that have been cut in my district are mostly vouchers of inexperienced federal criminal defendant, cr criminal defense lawyers, people who don't know the lay of the land for whom um, basic 3,500 uh, 3, principles or basic boilerplate type uh, information is all new to them. So, you know, it is new to them. It wouldn't be new to us. And um, so my district doesn't have a, a, a rule like that. But 
again, the CJA rep was asked to counsel them about that type of thing so that there wasn't overbilling. That's point number one. Point number two, the other way my district addresses those kinds of issues is that there's a de facto pool or cartel, if you will, of lawyers who always get the same kind of cases. For example, we in the Middle District of Florida are the headquarters for Operation Panama Express. That means we have a constant flow of these maritime drug smuggling cases um, and they're all um, indigent, they're all um, not citizens, and they all speak Spanish. And so there's a, a, a sort of a cohort of lawyers in my district on the panel who specialize in that. They are generally native Spanish speakers and um, they just do a ton of boat cases. And the, the, the judges and the magistrates know who they are and they continue to get appointments on those type of cases because the court knows that they're not going to be billing for the same thing over and over again because there are so many elements of those cases that are the same. Um, and so that's one way that they choose to deal with it. Um, but it also means that new lawyers, you know, can't get into that cohort, can't get into that cartel of lawyers um, who might just as, you know, provide just as good a defense um, because this little group is, is you know, concentrated and the judges know them and they're going to protect that fiefdom. So. so does it also mean you don't ever see creative motions work in those cases because the same people are doing the same thing again and again and again? Uh, you know, you would think, but I don't believe that to be true. I mean, you know, what happens is if the cases are the same, the motions are the same. But when the cases change, so for example, when we went from like freighters to semi-submersibles, all that semi-submersible litigation was out of Tampa and the guys were pretty creative with it, you know? Um, so I, I wouldn't say that, but the, to the extent that the elements of those cases are the same, you know, they're, tr you know, they're treated the same. They're just not that different. Um, and, and, you know, you might, you might suppose that maybe new blood could provide a different way of looking at it. But again, because in my district there's no process for who gets appointed to what case, well, that, 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 that's maybe uh, sharpening the point of my question. What might new blood get you some more creative work on the same type of cases? Might. You know, might. But again, it's gonna, the, they're going to be appointed if they speak Spanish because we have to save money on interpreters. So only native Spanish speak, not only, mostly native Spanish speakers get appointed to those cases. So when Congress allocates money to a program like this, there are sort of two important elements. One is uh, the administration of the program. How, how, are, how, is the, how are the funds going to be spent and how, is the, how are the services going to be delivered? And then there's the, the accountability component or the oversight component. And, and now we all know that that oversight or accountability, specifically as it relates to voucher review, um, is in the hands of the judges themselves question I want to pose to you is um, if you were the person who was deciding how that accountability or oversight function was going to happen, what would, what would it look like? Would it, be the, would it be what it is right now? Would it be something different? Emperor Friendsley, I think, would be in charge of uh, <laughs> reviewing right. the, the vouchers. Yeah. Okay. I think I would like to see it in a federal defender's office with a panel administrator or someone who has experience as a defense attorney um, and who understands the challenges and the culture of that district. Um, I think I think that's the best best place for it because they can also then they're in a position to recognize that there are differences between clients and you'd want somebody that had experience representing an array of defendants so they knew the challenges that defense attorneys meet. I think the difficulty of some judges that have never had criminal experience or had to deal with a criminal client, um, it, it's just hard for them to understand. It was hard for me when I went from being a prosecutor to a defense attorney, just to understand what's involved with representing individuals. I think other people on different panels have said, you'll go meet with a client who 
you'll spend hours explaining the law and the plea, and you feel like you've made real headway, only to get a letter uh, two days later that they don't understand anything and you're trying to trick them. Um, and, and I don't think the court understands that. And I don't think people that have practiced defense work understand those challenges. So I, I think somebody, either that or intense counseling and training of the judges, um, you know, could work if it stayed with the judiciary. But I think someone that's done the similar work is probably in the best position to do it. There's, I think one of the issues that we have when the, judi judi excuse me, when the judiciary does it is something that Judge Cogburn said the other day. He said that whoever does it needs to be a good steward of the taxpayer's money. Um, and I think that's correct and there needs to be oversight. But Judge Walton, you were talking about the difference between retained practice and CJA practice. And an example came to mind, and I think this may answer the question. If you say to a retained client, I want to hire this expert this and do a psych evaluation and it's going to cost about $5,500 and I think it's going to help me maybe in your case more effectively argue for a low end of the guideline sentence and the client's going to say well that might save me two years absolutely here's $5,000 if they have it but in a, a CJA case if you were to submit that to a judge to say you know, I want $5,000 and this may help me get the low end versus the middle end or the low end versus the high end. I don't think the court is going to see that in most cases as a good use of taxpayer money. Um, and for that reason, I think getting it out of the judicial branch may be, may be helpful. And it has to be somebody who doesn't handle cases in the courthouse. Years ago, the administrative office called me because I did all these big white collar complex cases and asked me if I would take on the task <coughs> in my district of being um, a consultant to the panel for attorneys who wanted to, who wanted extraordinary case resources and, um, and make recommendations to the court as to whether their requests were reasonable. And I said, you mean like a full-time job? Well, I don't know, we haven't really decided that, whether it's gonna be a job or whether you could do it, you know, as a, a CJA, on a CJA rate on an hourly basis. I said, I'm not going to take a job, um, a full-time job and give up my <coughs> private practice. And as for doing it um, on an hourly basis on a CJA rate, that's not gonna happen. I, I'm not going to go to judges and, and make the case and be fighting with judges on behalf of this lawyer's request. I don't even want to do it for myself, you know? And as far as I know, that whole idea was dropped um, because they couldn't get anybody to take that role on who, who still practiced, you know, in front of those judges. Who would want to do that? Put them, oh, I'll go, I'll, I'll be on the firing line. You know, David, you just stay home and I'll make the case for you. You know, nobody would want to do that. That's crazy. So I would and just can, like Can to I just follow up on that? And are you saying nobody would want to do that? I assume you're saying, you're not saying it because you wouldn't want to engage in the fight because that's kind of, no, no. I assume that's who do you I, are. Do I look like I wouldn't want to engage in the fight? <laughs> that was my assumption. So f to follow through, the reason you wouldn't want to do that is because you would believe that there would be repercussions to your own practice. Exactly, exactly. To my practice, for my, pay, my, my private clients, to my, the potential to ever getting appointed another one of these good CJA cases that was the reason they were calling me in the first place, all of those things. So I would just like to very quickly recommend the land of unicorns and ice cream doesn't make you fat. You know, that the, the upstate South Carolina lawyer recommended her district. If we had that, I mean, life would be PG keen in the middle district of Florida. We have nothing. So that, that system sounds like paradise to me. If, if the Mark Jones model were to be adopted as the standard where you had this uh, administrator who is knowledgeable in criminal offense function uh, who was within the defender's office but had the separation and answered your concern, Ms. Reback, in terms of potential conflict and whatnot. What, if any, role would you all see to be appropriate for judges in that system? 
them? Because certainly that would be a way to answer the question of how to deliver the services and how to have accountability for the services. But as far as in that system, would there still be any role uh, for a judge and what would you perceive it to be? You know, I I think this is going to sound crazy, but there should be no role for judges in this. And, and it should be the same as the U.S. Attorney's Office. The judges don't oversee whether they hire an expert, whether they bring an extra agent onto a case, whether they do any of those things. And for some reason, it's ingrained in us that for the defense side, there needs to be some judge overlooking the defense lawyer to make sure that the defense lawyer doesn't overspend the taxpayer money. It's the same taxpayer money on the government side. And nobody's overlooking them. The judges aren't on them saying, you know, you probably don't need that third paralegal carrying the box into the courthouse. You could probably carry that box yourself, prosecutor. <laughs> um, there's none of that going on. And, you know, um, we all carry our own boxes. We're going to keep carrying our own boxes. We're not going to, if it's left up to us and the public defender, we're not going to bring on an investigator to carry the boxes and waste the taxpayer money. So, so I think even though it's deeply ingrained in us that, that judges need to babysit. need to look over and babysit us, it, 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 it is, we've grown up. We, we don't need that anymore. Mr. Marcus, I agree with, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, I, I have enough to do on my docket I, sure uh, where I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't mind giving up this responsibility. <laughs> I think, unfortunately, that may not be a political reality. Uh, yeah. If it's not a political reality, yeah. what's the best next alternative? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Maybe uh, the, an administrator at the circuit level and just bypass the district court, the judges who are going to hear the case. You know, maybe if there's, I mean, or maybe a, a financial limit, like if you go above $5,000 above the cap, then yet you need pre-circuit approval, something like that. Can I ask a question about circuit? Um, because that's one of the questions we have. How do you feel it is that a circuit judge who has nothing to do with your case is going to have any sense um, right. of, of w what amounts of money you should be spending? And I'll give you an example. I'm a border court. Um, the realities on the border are so different um, than you know, other places, and, and what makes a circuit judge have any sense of that? Right. I mean, really, I, I, I'm just trying to think of a way to take it away from the district court judges who are going to hear the case, because I just really don't think that's appropriate. So I think, I think that there is a role for the court to play, and I think it's at the front end in the composition of the CJA panel for that district. And it goes back to trust, and I think the court's involvement in putting together a panel of attorneys that it trusts uh, and annually you know, or every couple years reviewing that panel to make sure that that panel still has the trust and the confidence of the court is where the court can play a role. It seems like in all other aspects, you know, if you don't like the decision, there's some bureaucracy that goes up, except here it goes straight to the court. I don't know if Maybe there's some function that can be created, you know, within the administrative office that's not a, a judiciary, not a judge, but someone who's dedicated to reviewing CJA work. So just like the districts have someone who's done defense works, so maybe we have somebody at the national level. And if you don't like what the district, you know, federal defender's office has done to your voucher, there's something that's created, you know, where you can appeal that. Um, so I think there are mechanisms that can be created that don't send us to the Article Three judges. You know, I've, I've agreed with every single thing Mr. Jones has said, except for involving the judges in the composition of the panel. Um, you know, again, we, we don't ask the Public Defender's Office to get approval from the judges before they hire a lawyer. We don't ask the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, to go to judges before they hire a lawyer. We shouldn't ask the panel to seek approval of the judges before they bring on a lawyer. Um, so so I, I just think Again, it's, it's, we, we want to be liked by these judges, um, and so we want to make sure that they're involved in our process. Um, but but 
I don't think the judges really want to be involved in the process, like Judge Walton says. David, don't you think the judges can provide? I'm not talking about, you know, select or not select because I think that gives the same problem. But don't you think judges can provide meaningful input on the quality of lawyering? I that do. yes, that yes. That, for sure. And that's why I think we should have a, a committee, yeah. judges among them, you know, uh, a committee that that reviews applications for lawyers who want to serve on the panel, and perhaps. Um, a, that same committee could allocate the lawyers among different tiers of professional practice as CJA lawyers. So you might start out being, uh, you know, general felony uh, lawyer. And if you choose, if it's part of your professional goals, you could progress up to complex case representation. Um, if you want to work part time or you want to work from home or whatever, and you want a more limited practice, maybe you choose to just do habeas or appeals. Um, and, and this committee, of which, lawyer, of which judges could and should be a part, um, I think would be the way to, to create and maintain the panel and, and review the panel regularly. But not just judges. I mean, there should be respected panel lawyers on, on the committee. There should be just no prosecutors, maybe representative of the public defender's office, you know, people who are in court all the time and see the work that the lawyers do. And, and just so I understand, would the committee you have in mind play a role in <coughs> granting or disapproving requests for, say, experts, for example? Or not, is it so not if we had you know, the South Carolina model, but maybe it could be the review, maybe that, maybe it could be the review, uh, you know, carry out the review function of those decisions by a CJA administrator. Because it, it does seem like, and, and David, this is largely a response to you, the, the core difference between an individual CJA lawyer and say a public defender's office or a prosecutor's office is in those larger offices, there's some structure where someone's saying, here's the caseload, here are the resources we have, and then they set some baseline assumption of here's when you can go to an expert or here's how much time you can spend on a case given the resources more broadly, whereas with an individual who does not have that structure, they don't have any such natural limit. And if you, you know, told people hypothetically, spend as many hours as you want or hire an expert whenever you want, you know, it's hard to know when, what the natural limits would be of that. Well, let me just make sure, and, and you know, Orrin, I, I'm not advocating that lawyers should be able to do whatever they want. What I, I, I just think the structure should be, instead of asking um, judges, I think we should be discussing it with the public defender. Um, so, so, you know, there would be a public defender review of, of uh, experts or investigators or vouchers as opposed to judges review so so I want to be clear I don't think I don't think it should just be limitless yeah. uh, that would that would create other problems but um, not the public defender you mean the Chinese wall public defender employee the, the public defender I mean an ideal word that employee but but yeah I mean I, I think this this conflict idea is overstated I don't think there's going to be I don't think a public defender is going to say you know um, uh, they shouldn't have that that uh, investigator because of some co-defendant issue. I just I, I don't see the conflict issue coming up all that often. When it does, we can address it like we do anything else. But but I I know there's been a lot of talk about conflict with the public defender running it, um, and and maybe I'm just not seeing it. But I I just don't see this huge danger in having the public defender's office uh, administering the CGA panel. I I, I think that. Uh you know, the potential for conflict exists in multi-defendant cases with conflicting defenses or where the, the, the prosecutor basically says it's you're all on the bus or you're all, or, or you're all off the bus, you know, uh, those kinds of deals are on the table. I think that there is a, a great potential for conflict. So I'm comfortable with the South Carolina model where the public def it's a public defender employee because likely as not they're experienced with criminal defense, but they're Chinese walled off from the cases that the public defender's office handles. I think that that would be conflict free, it would be administered easily, it would be efficient, and perhaps if we need a review 
other than the circuit, because I agree with you, Judge Cardone, I, the circuit doesn't make sense, but if we need a review of, of that person's uh, determinations, then maybe it should be that committee where it's judges, public defenders, and or their representatives, uh, and experienced panel attorneys. Maybe that's the key to review. Does that person need to be someone in your district, that, that individual panel administrator? I'm saying because, and look, frankly, there's not a lawyer in my office who would take this job for love or money. So it's got to be somebody who's decided that they're done practicing, which means it has to be an employee in their busy districts where we'll need four of those people or eight of those people, and there are other districts where we need, you know, half of a person. So could, could it be someone outside the district performing that role? I don't know. Again, you know, to the extent that the judges have to sign those orders, and the person doesn't know the judges and, and what they're like and how they like to have things presented and what they're likely to do. I don't know, it would be best if it was someone from the district, but someone is better than no one. Yes. I don't think it's necessary to have somebody from the district. It'd be nice if there was someone that was close enough to know a little bit about the district, but North Carolina, for example, has three different federal districts, I think one person could oversee all three districts because they'd have enough time to understand the different cultures of different districts. It's still going to be a government employee, so you're still always going to have the partiality question or it's always going to be looming there as a matter. There's no way to get rid of that. Well, you've got government money being spent, so someone in the government's going to oversee that. The question is, what is their bent? I mean. I mean, I'll give you an example. When a lawyer comes to me and wants money for a case, my question isn't, you know, do you absolutely need this? My question is sort of, is this likely to be beneficial to the case? How is it likely to be beneficial to the case? Have you considered the particular judge involved? Have you considered whether this expert is really the best expert? Maybe you ought to look at this other expert. And then finally down the line, did you ask him if he cut $25 an hour for his fee? <laughs> well, if you asked him 25 already, maybe you can go get 50 from him off of his fee. So that's sort of like the last set of questions. So it's a question of the orientation of the individual making those decisions more than it is just is there any oversight my lawyers have oversight yeah. Ruben if I may follow up on that there, there's two or three other models uh, they've been used a little bit in the federal courts not a lot judge Gleason referred to one uh, this morning that he and I've been working with and, and that's a circuit case budgeting or case managing attorney my guess is that none of you have worked with any of them oh, yeah. you have okay oh, yeah. I'd like to hear your comments about that another is a a district uh, focus and it's a <clears throat> excuse me a CJ supervising attorney uh, all these are people who've had uh, criminal experience before and uh, but are not working in the defender office and then we have a model in the Ninth Circuit which is unique in the nation and it's an appellate attorney who uses the CJ vouchers at the Court of Appeals so uh, those are people who would not be in the defender office would not necessarily have the issues of conflict but I would, uh, particularly, Ms. Reback, if you'd comment, but if any of the others of you would like to comment about that or ask questions, I'd be very interested in what your thoughts are. Well, the fir my first experience with that type of a person was years ago when um, we started to get uh, the kind of discovery that now is just commonplace, which is, you know, there was a, a ton of material given to us in digital form. And none of us were prepared to deal with that. Um, we, <laughs> we couldn't even, as panel attorneys, go out to Staples and buy a hard drive. And the government wouldn't give us our discovery unless we supplied the hard drive. We had to file a motion to buy the hard drive or to be reimbursed for the hard drive so that we could give it to the government so they could load it up with material and then give it back to us. And at that point, um, they did, somebody earlier was talking about this antiquated program that they had, that they used that was, I guess, proprietary to their office. We didn't have it. We couldn't run it. It was, it was just a giant mess. And I was referred to somebody from the Defender Services office who was in Colorado who was supposed to be like a tech specialist. And, uh, and it was a disaster, frankly. It was just a disaster. Um, you know, his, we were so far behind and he was so far ahead 
and the things that he was telling me that we had to have, nobody in the district had, nobody was going to grant. It, it was just, it was cumbersome, it was, it was inefficient, um, and it took months. That was the other thing. It took <coughs> months. It took months for me to get a hard drive. It became a joke. It became a joke. Um, that was experience number one. Experience number two with case budgeting um, was a little different. It was, as I said earlier, I, um, you know, I did these big cases, these big complex cases. I pretty much didn't do any other kind of CJA cases. So when I got called by the AO to be a case budgeting advisor um, and I rejected it, I declined politely, respectfully. What? You know, um, at that point, um, I just became an informal case budgeting advisor for my panel. And people would call me up and they would want to spend all this time. And quite frankly, it became very expensive in terms of my time to do that. Um, we didn't have, we did not have, a, during my practice, we did not have an actual case budgeting attorney in my district. So if you needed help with case budgeting, you would have to call the Defender Services Office uh, for help. And there were people there who would help you, but none of the new CJA lawyers knew that. They didn't know they could call AO for help with case budgeting, for help with sentencing issues, for help with anything. They didn't know that. I think the 11th doesn't yet have a circuit budgeting attorney, but the 4th does have one in place. It, the, I'm sorry, the 11th doesn't yet have a circuit budgeting attorney, but the 4th does have one in place. Have any of those of you in the 4th Circuit used the, service, the services of the circuit budgeting attorney? Uh, and can you tell us about a little about the experience? Was it positive? Uh, How did it work? That, that case, uh, I, I had called the budgeting attorney about. It wasn't supposed to be a big case that required a budget based on what I knew about it. But I had a feeling it was going to run over the, the statutory cap. And because he was, he, he was newly appointed, he hasn't been in there very long, I knew he was going to be re reviewing the voucher later on. I just called him up and said, what in the world do you need me to do in order to try to, to get this uh, fee or voucher approved at a later date? And he and I just talked about it uh, uh, for a while and said, you know, put more detail in your in your time sheets and your bills and your, your things of that nature so the judge just has more information, which I, I'm sure he's talking to the judges so it made perfect sense. But I did not have to do a budget in that. It was, it was more along the lines of what do we need to do to try to make sure everybody's happy down the road in this case. And, you know, I sent a letter to the judge saying, I think this is going to be over. I've talked to the attorney up here. And, if it if it gets out of control, you know we'll we'll have to do a budget if it's for trial or something. But uh, I did use a budgeting attorney out of uh, another circuit in the terrorism case that I did, which was a large case with a lot of money, a lot of paralegal work, and I can't remember the individual's name, but I'd never done a budget, so he walked me through that process, and we were able to get that approved, and uh, it was timely paid. Uh, I think monthly, if not mistaken, over a period of maybe two years. Or, or well, what what circuit was that? Uh, the circuit where the budget and attorney was. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have one at that point, so I, I made use of one of the. It was uh, it was. Uh, Second Circuit, New York. Jerry Tritz. Jerry Tritz. I don't remember. No, okay. It's just been a, it's been a while, but it was a wonderful service because they had been doing it. We had not, so I had no experience. And the difficulty is you don't know what you're going to do in the case, and you're wholly dependent on someone telling you this is what we're going to give you when you're doing the budget as well. So you're you're dependent on the U.S. Attorney's Office getting this case organized and telling you this is what you're going to have to deal with because you're kind of flying in the dark because you don't want to have to amend it over and over and over again. But I thought it was a good service or process, to be honest. Mitch Cadone? I, I have a question about mega cases. Um, I, I, how many of you have done, um, like, 
a mega case, I, th I think you've sort of indicated with your terrorism case, um, then uh, about the budgeting process um, where you've actually, you know, had to submit that kind of a budget, um, gotten your judge to approve it, and then it's gone up to the circuit and it's been cut, or are they generally approved? And then um, what's the status of interim vouchers for you on those kinds of cases? Are, are, do, do your judges generally grant interim vouchers? And I'd really like to hear from each of you because you each come from a different area um, as to that process. Mine were approved and, and paid on an interim basis uh, every four to six weeks, uh, give or take uh, a few, because the judge was trying the case as well as reviewing vouchers and, and, and trying to go through all that process at one time, but I, it, it worked well. It, it took some effort on everybody's part because it's not something you do every day. I'm not familiar, um, and I might be mistaken, but if any cases have been designated as mega cases within the middle district, I know in the Western District of North Carolina, we're just now starting to get online, and there's been new guidance about uh, trying to reach out to the court early if it's going to be a case that's likely to be protracted or a high doc case. Um, I know that there are other CJA attorneys that have requested and have received interim vouchers, um, but I don't know that I have enough data to accurately report it from the West. By, by and large, in this district, the, the judges are good about the mega cases and, and um, helping us with interim payments. There are some that, that, that don't like to do it, but by and large they do. Um, and the budgets have, have mostly been approved because what happens is the lawyers get together um, and sort of speak to lawyers who have done it before, before that judge and figure out the best way to work it. And the judge, judges are, are very helpful. I, I know the time is sort of running out and so I just want to say one last thing, which is you know, representing poor people is very, very hard. Um, and and it, it's a burden on, on the lawyers who do it, from going to the jail and waiting to get in and, 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 and dealing with the discovery and the prosecutors and the judges. And I know Judge Walton's question was right on, which is, you know, how can we do this in a way that, that, that can get by the political barricades? And it's, it's very, very difficult, and, and you guys are in a very hard position on how to put together a report that has some political viability. I think at the end of the day, all of us just want it to be a little easier. You know, we, we just want it to be a little easier so we don't have to beg so much. So we don't have to, so there's not so many hurdles in just providing basic representation to our clients. So I don't know how to politically put that together in the best way, Judge. Um, that's what, you know, you guys are being paid the big bucks to do. Um, but, but I think what all of us just want is it to be a little easier. That's all. Um, I only did mega cases for the last like eight years of my practice, so I, I can speak to this. Um, again, it's about the, the trust and, and respect between the judges and the lawyers or the lack of it. So I believe I hold the record in my district, in my division anyway, for like the longest, the longest pretrial continuances um, and the most interim payments ever. Because I did these mega cases, one of which, for example, was an international insurance fraud case that the government had investigated for 12 years involving three different uh, law enforcement agencies in three different districts. At one point, in fact, there, was, there were two stings going on where one agency and one district had a sting going on where they were selling fraudulent insurance and looking for the buyers, and the other was buying what they thought was fraudulent insurance, and they were investigating each other for a period of 18 months. That's how ridiculously complicated and silly this case was. But it was complicated, and my the judge who had it knew me, um, knew enough about the case because there were all kinds of MLATs and letters rogatory and what have you that had come before him pre-trial or uh, pre-indictment. Um, so he knew enough about the case to know that it really was this crazy complex case. He approved all the interim vouchers. He approved my budget. He approved my uh, need to hire an attorney slash investigator in Costa Rica. Uh, to hire a notary in uh, St. Thomas. All these 
different kind. It was like a phenomenally expensive case, and he, he approved it um, because he understood that it was necessary to the defense. Um, on the other hand, I had another ridiculously mega case in front of a different judge that was also international, that was also a crazy uh, multi-district kind of case. And uh, I represented a, a lawyer um, from Texas and, who was uh, charged with fraud. And um, in that case, I worked on that case with that original judge, the same one from the crazy case, uh, insurance fraud case. I worked on the, this other case, the lawyer case, for three years. And that original, that judge approved all my vouchers, approved interim payments, approved experts, et cetera, et cetera. And then the government decided to uh, sever my defendant from the rest of the case, and it got reassigned to a different judge for trial. That judge, we were three weeks away from trial, and that judge just took another look at the pretrial services report and noticed that my client had I don't know, $85,000 in an IRA, and decided that she was no longer indigent three weeks from trial, and basically fired me as a CJA lawyer, um, despite three years of preparation, and then said, go get the $85,000 from your client if you are going to try the case. And I said, I'm the only lawyer. I, I, I can't put my client in that position. You, you're basically coercing her to hire me and spend her $85,000 on me. That, that's inappropriate. I mean, I think it's unethical. Um, but, you know, that's what he did. Um, I didn't pursue the case um, after that. And um, that judge was just not going to grant any further vouchers, any further resources, or anything. And so, you know, she wound up hiring another lawyer case got continued for six months, and it went to trial. We're not a hotbed of mega case litigation involving indigent defendants. I, I can't recall one. Thanks. I think we're out of time. We need to wrap up, but it's been very helpful. Thank you all for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a, uh, about a 10-minute break.